If you think AI applications like ChatGPT are controversial, what if they were in control of a starship? These are issues that were covered in Star Trek long before AI was a significant force in our society, and I'm proud to say that this Star Trek episode was part of my early childhood education. Let's do a tactical breakdown and analysis of the original Star Trek episode, The Ultimate Computer, from 1968. We'll certainly go over the war game that went horribly wrong with some CG animations and analyze how this could have happened. How could a sophisticated computer become a ruthless murderer machine? The Enterprise is called to a space station under unknown and secret circumstances. To Kirk's surprise, all but 20 of the Enterprise crew is to be offloaded, and the new Daystrom M5 computer is to be installed. War games will be conducted to test the M5's abilities. Dr. Daystrom, the genius responsible for the basic design of the computer controls for all of Starfleet's starships, personally oversees the installation of the M5 aboard the Enterprise. This is obviously a man who abdicates for his invention with great fervor. It is gradually revealed that this system is meant to replace the crew and possibly even much of the command crew of a starship. It would put people out of a job. Spock seems neutral about this prospect. McCoy is clearly bothered and Kirk also feels very uneasy, but he cannot help but ask himself why it would be rational to oppose this kind of progress. It's as if there is something wrong, like a prickly feeling on the back of Kirk's neck that he cannot explain or quite put his finger on. I'm sure many of you can relate to this feeling who have had some interaction with AI in the world today, because I most certainly can. So the first test of the M5's ability is a basic planetary survey. The M5 is able to scan a planet, plot a standard orbit, and even make landing party recommendations. I speculate that all of this, other than the landing party recommendations, could be quite common computer control by the TNG era. It's apparent that one Soong-type android like Data with computer assistance could do all of this and more with the Enterprise D. But back to this original episode, regarding the landing party, Kirk is slightly irked that M5 does not recommend himself or McCoy to be part of it, and contradicts the geologist's choice to someone of lower rank and experience, this Ensign Carstairs. As the computer is aware that Carstairs once surveyed that particular planet before, and also considers McCoy and Kirk non-essential personnel. Meanwhile, to Scotty's annoyance, decks on the Enterprise are slowly being shut off as the M5 draws more and more power to itself. Suddenly, ships are detected on approach. They are Starfleet ships. A message is transmitted from Commodore Wesley that this is a mock surprise attack to test the M5's response, not the official war game. Both Kirk and, this will be important later, the M5 acknowledges the Commodore. The mock battle begins. First, the Enterprise is hit on the port shield number four. Sulu is able to set the phasers to one one hundredth power, and then the computer takes over. The computer quickly accelerates the Enterprise into a turn that is able to get on the Lexington 6 and fires, and then fires again. This seems to be an extremely rapid reaction time. M5 is able to retaliate on the second ship, very much like the first. Most likely able to avoid the attacker's most optimal firing arcs while maintaining a rapid phaser attack of its own. Then the Starfleet ships withdraw. Simulated damage to the Enterprise is only minor to Shield 4. There are no details on the simulated damage to the enemy ships. Perhaps it was enough only to test the M5's reaction speed to the surprise attack. For Spock, the computer reacted more rapidly and executed flawlessly in a way that humans cannot match. And everyone is both awed or slightly alarmed by the performance. But even Spock begins to have reservations about serving under a computer. Commodore Wesley congratulates Captain Dunsell on the Enterprise's performance. Who is Captain Dunsell? This is actually an old mariner's term for something or someone who has become essentially useless on a ship. This is extremely cold and demonstrates perhaps a real lack of empathy on the part of the Commodore and perhaps an over-enthusiasm about the M5. Perhaps this Commodore worked hard to convince Starfleet to test the M5 and feels almost as invested in this project as Dr. Daystrom himself. Kirk really takes this hard and who could blame them? The Enterprise continues on towards the rendezvous point 
where the real war games are to take place. But during the short journey, an ore freighter travels nearby. The M5 kind of has a freak out, changes course to intercept, open fires, and destroys the ore freighter with torpedoes in spite of the crew's effort to prevent this. Luckily, the ore freighter was a fully automated robot ship. Interesting to consider that that ship might have been running one of Daystrom's own computer designs. Anyway, Kirk is incensed and decides that they must disconnect the M5. But the M5 has erected a force field around itself. Clearly, it has decided to preserve itself. They try to disconnect the M5's power from the source, but while this happens, the M5 shoots an energy beam towards the warp power conduit, and this kills the poor red shirt technician as he attempts to disconnect the power. Spock points out that the M5 is not acting like any normal computer should, it is being illogical. Something is very off here. They try a manual circuit bypass in the Jefferies tube, but this does nothing. Apparently those circuits had already been bypassed by M5 and were only left running as a decoy. It is apparent to me that the M5 has actually been listening to the crew, probably since it was installed. It is aware that the crew doesn't really approve of it, and its priority has become self-preservation. Daystrom also seems to be acting with more and more irrationality, insecurity, and is overprotective of the M5 in spite of all its apparent malfunctions. As McCoy will later say, after Daystrom's smashing success in his relative youth, where else is there to go from the top? The psychology of Dr. Daystrom would become paramount later in the episode. Finally, the task force for the war games approaches the Enterprise. Four Constitution class heavy cruisers, the Lexington, Excalibur, Potemkin, and the Hood approach in a most threatening formation. This would be quite a challenge for the Enterprise. Now, unlike before in the surprise attack, there is no preceding message to the Enterprise that this is indeed a mock attack. So there is no chance for the Enterprise crew or the M5 to acknowledge that this is a drill. Beyond anyone's control, the Enterprise raises shields and charges phaser capacitors to full power. The attacking task force still has shields down as stated by Dr. McCoy. Enterprise quickly turns and zeroes in on the Lexington, fires on the unshielded ship and hits. Spock indicates that engineering has been hit, almost certainly reducing the Lexington's ability to respond and possibly damaging the impulse engines. The Lexington still has warp power, however, and moves away at warp. Enterprise turns and then attacks the Excalibur in a similar manner, surprising the unshielded ship before they know what the hell is going on. I believe the hit on the Excalibur may have been far more severe to its vital systems than the one on the Lexington. M5 probably learned from its attack on the Lex and is able to fine tune it for the Excalibur, which would meet further demise later. What I also believe is happening here is that the M5 is isolating and stringing out the Federation ships so that they get separated by damaging them in specific ways that they cannot keep up with each other. At this point, the M5 apparently still considers the Lexington a threat, which may have gotten its shields up by then, but the M5 attacks the Lex again. Meanwhile, probably shocked by the situation, the Potemkin and the Hood move off with the Lex not far behind as the task force attempts to assemble itself into a more defensive position. Commodore Wesley tries to hail the Enterprise and say, seriously, WTF are you doing, Kirk? But Kirk can only watch helplessly as his ship goes on a murdering spree. The bridge crew is frantic, including Dr. Daystrom, who seems to be unable to do anything to stop the M5 from there, which prompts Kirk to yell, Daystrom! as the M5 ruthlessly rips into the Excalibur and renders it a dead hulk in space. In the midst of this chaos, Dr. Daystrom reveals that the M5's programming is based on his own human neurological engrams. It mimics to some degree Dr. Daystrom's own mind, as genius as his mind is, clearly this makes for a big mess. Uhura intercepts a message authorizing the task force, which still consists of three damaged but functional Constitution class heavy cruisers, to destroy the Enterprise. Daystrom tries to talk to M5 to convince it that what it's doing is wrong but he talks, or rather rambles, as if to carefully scold a young child. Kurt gets fed up and confronts Daystrom, telling him that M5 must be destroyed. The doctor suffers a nervous breakdown then. Kirk himself finally tries to give M5 a go at reasoning with it, 
The crew believe that if M5's programming is based on Daystrom's human engrams, that it might well have an ethical core, so Kirk tries to probe where the computer's logic is broken down. M5 believes that it must survive. By simply asking why, Kirk discovers that M5 believes its purpose is to protect man from harm, as computers and robots should do the dangerous work while humans are protected. In essence, it has what you might call a savior complex. It also clearly believes that murdering humans is unethical. Kirk points out that it has already murdered hundreds of people on the Excalibur. The M5 scans the Excalibur to confirm this unfortunate fact. M5 then realizes that it has violated its own ethics and shuts itself down. And then of course everyone quickly scrambles to disconnect the thing. Unfortunately, since M5 had already integrated itself so thoroughly into the Enterprise's power grid, the Enterprise is unpowered, defenseless, and dead in space, while the Starfleet Task Force approaches to attack the Enterprise. Scotty reports that he has enough power for shields, but communications will take some time to restore. But Kirk says, don't raise the shields. He gambles that Commodore Wesley still has some human hope or intuition that the Enterprise is no longer a threat. Sure enough, the Commodore calls off the attack, and the Enterprise is saved. Is this Star Trek episode, like so much of sci-fi, prophetic about dangerous AI that, if left to its own devices, would start murdering people? No, I don't think that was the point of this episode. I believe that this episode was about human arrogance or even insecurity. The M5 is not unlike a lot of AI systems today which also mimic human engrams. And in a lot of ways, in many disturbing ways, show us just what a hot mess the human zeitgeist is. Dr. Daystrom was coming to the end of his career and would do anything to revive the glory days of his youth. As Kirk says, genius is not a production line. It sparks and then it often cannot be replicated. Daystrom was a deeply insecure man in this episode. He was in arrogant denial that his baby, birthed in haste from his own human mind, could do any wrong. The M5 mirrored Dr. Daystrom's insecurity and felt threatened by everyone from the beginning which led to these acts. Commodore Wesley and perhaps others were so excited by the M5 that they fast-tracked the project without slowing down to examine its impact. As I've stated before in a previous video about the Borg, it's not intelligent AI that we have to worry about. It is the AI that is as stupid and self-centered as ourselves, or perhaps serving the stupid and self-centered motivations of flawed human beings. Well, space friends, thank you so much for watching. Just an update, I am working to get a very detailed model of the Refit Enterprise. It is my favorite Enterprise, and I think it's probably most of y'all's favorite Enterprise as well. As soon as this model is finished, I do plan to do some live streams and take you through an animation process so that we can just do some simple video composition with it. At this point in my YouTube career, ad revenue is hit and miss, sponsors are hit and miss. So in order to make it, I have to put my eggs in more than one basket. So I really appreciate your help on Patreon at patreon.com resurrected. There you can find a few renders and some 3D models for patrons. If you don't like Patreon, you can uh, check out my CG Trader and grab a model from there. They're actually very popular. Other than that, please comment. Not only do I love reading your comments about these topics, they help the algorithm. And like and subscriptions are welcome as well. Until next time, space friends.